Thank you everyone uh, to, uh, for joining us today on our webinar. Um, we're here today to talk about a really interesting topic, uh, chart the unknown security gaps in your uh, environment um, and all about our advanced security services. Uh, before we start, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, you're on mute and your video is off, but if you'd like to ask a question, uh, feel free to use the chat feature to our panelists or to me and we'll get your questions answered. Um, this, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent out as well as listed on our YouTube channel. So you'll receive that uh, tomorrow. Um, to get started, uh, I'd like to introduce you first to our panelists. Uh, first, we have Matt Briggs, who is our Director of New Business Development and Channel Sales, and John Protest, uh, Channel Account Manager. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to you guys. Matt and John, take it away. Yeah, thank, thank you, Bethany. I appreciate it. I'm going to go in. Uh, full screen mode here. Uh, let's see. Sherman can see that. Is that coming across okay? Looks good. Looks good. All right. Well, good morning or, or good afternoon, everyone, depending on, on where you're joining from. Um, as always, we appreciate you spending time with us today. Uh, as Bethany mentioned, this session is, is going to be recorded. That means, Johnny, you have to behave yourself uh, and, and, you know, Making it available after the fact, I think it'd be helpful because we've got you know a fair amount of ground uh, to cover in the next hour or so. Um, I'd also ask you to to please use your chat feature to ask questions. We love uh, you know questions and, and we love responding to them. So uh, periodically, what we'll do is we'll, we'll stop uh, you know the uh, the webinar, the presentation, and, and see if we've got questions that we can address. So, as, as Bethany said, my name is Matt Briggs. I'm the Director of New Business Development and Channel Sales at Diopath. I've been with the company uh, for 19 years now, uh, and cybersecurity is uh, absolutely a passion of mine. So, I'm really excited to be talking about this particular topic today. Uh, and then, Johnny, go, go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I am the uh, Channel Manager for Diopath. Please. Feel free to reach out, you know, after this webinar, uh, if any questions as well that you don't want to post on the webinar. Yeah. Thanks, Johnny. Um, so, as far as the objective, um, what we want to do today is walk you through and dissect uh, the different elements that comprise the, the, the really the cybersecurity journey. Um, you know, given that there is so much confusion, noise, where do we start, um, what do we do, and you know, we want to kind of help cut through the confusion and chaos. So, uh, we'll certainly have time in the future to, to kind of dig into the nuts and bolts, and if you want to have a more technical com conversation as a sidebar, please reach out to us, reach out to your uh, appropriate account manager. But what we're hearing uh, is how challenging it is uh, on a daily basis to sort of navigate through uh, the, the cybersecurity journey. And by the way, this doesn't just pertain to smaller companies. This is mid-market, it's enterprise, it's education, it's public sector, um, you know, so, so organizations that you think would uh, maybe have things figured out, uh, it isn't the case. So if you're in that spot, you're, you're, you're certainly not alone. Um, so just, a quick uh, little overview, a recap of, of Diopath. Uh, if uh, if you don't know or, or, or don't remember, um, so we've been operating as a, an IT outsourcer uh, for the last 25 years. We are fast approaching 700 resources uh, on our payroll. Um, so there's certainly some um, advantages of scale that we can bring to bear in the market. Um, you know, things like next gen tools, uh, a deep bench of resources, uh, you know, best in class processes and, and methodology. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, um, our account management philosophy allows us to maintain a very uh, high touch uh, approach. So, as an example, our client account managers or technical account managers take care of a very small number of each of our valued clients. Um, so that we can deliver that that high touch experience. Um, also wanted to note uh, that we recently acquired uh, innovative technology solutions out of the Chicagoland area. 
um, and and they have uh, you know locations. And now we do you know scattered across the U.S. Uh, with them, we uh, welcome the ITS team members, clients, and, and partners with with open arms. We're really excited about uh, what the future holds for uh, uh, the organization after the acquisition. Um, and then as far as vitals, um, you know, you know, we're in uh, I think 22 different states. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we have presence in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, in Mexico, we've got nearshoring operations in Monterey, uh, and then also uh, resources in, uh, uh, in England and the United Kingdom as well. And then, uh, you know, now six service centers, two in Illinois. Uh, we also have presence in the Northeast, Southeast, you know, certainly, uh, you know, Texas being co-headquarters, and then, uh, you know, as I, I mentioned, uh, Monterey, um, and then, you know, we support a, a, a wide range of uh, organizations in many different vertical markets. So, uh, you know, there, there isn't a lot that, that we haven't seen out there. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, as, as, as far as our services, um, you know, obviously we're here to talk about cyber, uh, but please note that Diopath does offer a wide range of, of services. Uh, you know, on the MSP front, you know, we're providing end user support by our, our service desk, uh, you know, our, our network operations center, um, and, and uh, remote monitoring management capabilities are co-located with the service desk. Um, you know, we perform, um, you know, professional services, advisory services, you know, certainly staff augmentation. So again, there's a whole range of uh, offerings we have. And what we're hearing in the market is uh, organizations are looking for uh, accountability across the entire technology stack, um, you know, rather than trying to piecemeal vendors together. Obviously, it uh, uncomplicates things. It, it streamlines the process. So uh, we're, we're uh, happy to talk to you about other services if and when uh, the, the time is right. <clears throat> so as far as our security practice, um, so we have been at this uh, for 19 years now, providing advanced security um, solution. So certainly not a flash in the pan, uh, you know, not a scenario where we're uh, pivoting into an emerging market. Uh, you know, we've, uh, we've got pedigree here. Um, we operate in, in highly regulated industries, uh, healthcare, federal government, energy, uh, publicly traded companies, defense industry base, retail, I, you know, I could go on, um, uh, but also unregulated as well, right? So we appreciate, uh, you know, both sides of the coin. Um, and there's differing approaches in cybersecurity, depending on whether regulation is hanging over your head or, uh, you know, if it's, it's not. So, um, and then a few fun facts about us. Um, we got into uh, security in 2006, <clears throat> really as, as part of uh, Homeland Security being stood up after 9-11, uh, identifying critical infrastructure that supports the nation. And uh, we had former CIOs of utilities that helped utility companies harden their cyber and physical security to get accredited and certified with uh, the U.S. government. And in conjunction with that, we helped uh, you know, create and author uh, the NERC SIP standard in the energy space. So that's the framework that, that's used today uh, to align uh, uh, you know, energy sector uh, to uh, the right type of uh, uh, IT operational and IT security operational controls. And then um, we also uh, have top secret clearance with the federal government <clears throat> and why that might be important for other organizations outside of federal is we've created, uh, we, we've had to go through audits, assessments, you know, uh, apply you know, processes, policies, methodology, and all of our other clients uh, leverage off of that. Um, We've we've recently been recognized as one of the top uh, 100 managed security service providers globally. Uh, that happened about a month ago, so we're really proud of that. Um, and we've got a uh, U.S.-based security operations center that we'll talk a little bit about later. And then lastly, we're very focused on metrics, right? If you're going to partner with a third party, you want to be able to objectively verify that they're doing a good job for you. And the way to do that is through things like service level agreements, right? Are they being adhered to or are they not? It's black and white. Is an organization doing well? Are they saying what they, uh, are they doing what they said they would or, or not? So the, the metrics component of it 
is really important um, to us. So, so, Johnny, anything else to add here? Uh, just the emphasis on us being super metric driven. I think that's a key differentiator between us and other MSSPs that you guys might run across. So that's all Matt. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And then, um, you know, we, we have a lot of, uh, you know, conversations, kind of philosophical conversations about um, cybersecurity internally. And now more than ever, it feels like, the tail wagging the dog. I think that's a um, a good analogy. So, um, you know, the approach to making decisions are, you know, organizations are getting pushed and pulled, right? So lots of noise, confusion where to start, knee-jerk reactions to a breach, um, you know, chaos, uh, more of a tactical approach. You know, we, we see, um, uh, you know, this kind of misguided, let's focus on the tools and deploy those and then everything's going to be okay. And then even, you know, I've heard varying stats, uh, but, you know, there's close to 3.5 million unfulfilled IT security roles, right? So there's a lack of resources and, and these resources are, are expensive. But, you know, I, I think as far as the push and pull um, and the tail wagging the dog, dog, you know, you see, you know, breach is making the headlines, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, there's, there's decisions being made on cyber because of that. A, a big one right now that we're gonna talk about is insurance providers sending uh, a laundry list of questionnaires. And so now insurance uh, providers are starting to dictate, whether you like it or not, um, IT security operations, which is interesting. Um, there's certainly compliance and regulation in, in specific verticals. Um, and then even your partners and, and your customers are asking about operational controls in place, if you look at third party vendor risk uh, you know, management. So um, there's a, this basically led to a cycle of, in, in my opinion, investment in tools and instrumentation because you know, that's something that, that, that's tangible. You know, there's some marketing around it. Um, however, there, there's been, I'd say less investment in human capital so people and then also the process, right, associated with a, a good solid cybersecurity program. Um, so if, if you take nothing else away from this session, and I know for those of you that have met with us and met with me, uh, I'm gonna sound like a, a broken record, but security is this, this never ending um, journey. So it's not this linear approach where there's a, a you know a final you know destination, and so you know the, the focus should always be around um, continuous improvement and, and staying at least in lockstep with, with threat actors. It's not you know one one step ahead. So you know assessments, right? But, but, you know base baselining where you're at. Um, you know what to fix, where to go. Uh, you know training, elevating the you know the security consciousness and culture of uh, an organization. Programs and policies, right, which should, should be implemented. Um, otherwise, it's going to be this, you know, fail to plan and then plan to fail, um, you know, sort of uh, you know, mentality that, that, that sets in. Um, certainly advanced tools, people, process, which we'll get into. Things like managed SIM, um, security operation center as a service, EDR, vulnerability scanning, um, you know, th those need to be implemented um, you know, typically, right, to, to secure the environment. And then you need to have a, a well-documented um, incident uh, response plan, uh, do some tabletop exercises, test it, um, and then, you know, make sure that you're, you're ready when uh, an actual uh, breach or anomaly does, does occur. <clears throat> so, Johnny, uh, anything to, to add here? Um, you know, Matt, I I think uh, there were a couple slides back where you mentioned fixation on tools and instrumentation, and you kind yeah. of put that in the context of the the whole journey. I, I kind of like it might be kind of an oversimplified analogy, but really, you know, you can think of it as as flying an airplane, right? You might have all the tools and the instrumentation, but uh, you don't know where you're going. Uh, you've got to continually up the flight plan. It's kind of like a plane that's never going to land, 
but you've got to have a plan. You've got to have all the people and processes in place. And, and that's really where Diopath excels in, in helping customers get there and uh, feel not only put the, the pieces together and, and uh, you know, to, for the security program, but also uh, give customers peace of mind that they have been doing all the right things and continue to improve on security with us. Yeah, Th thanks, Johnny. Um, Bethany, I'll take a quick pause here. Any um, any questions from the attendees so far? Uh, Matt, I'm not seeing anything so far. All right, uh, thanks. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll check in, in about 15 minutes. Um, so um, the, the slide you're looking at here, um, I would say represents a, a simplified overview of the elements of the security journey, because you know that that's really what we want to talk about and kind of dig in to, to specific areas. So um, we feel that the best first step is to identify the drivers and the desired outcomes when evaluating a security initiative, whether you're going to do it, um, you know, internally um, or if you're going to engage a third party. And I know it sounds, <clears throat> you know, kind of one on one, one on one, but a lot of the times that that isn't occurring, right? It, you know, it's back to that whole knee jerk reaction to um, something that's happened. You're typically a breach and anomaly. Um, you know, I, I, I'd say, uh, you know, this is going to help you guys with a plan of attack and, and any partners that you engage. Um, it's, it's also, uh, I would say, helpful to value the assets that you're trying to protect. So really you can understand what level of investment to make how to build a case, right, with, with uh, uh, you know, the CFO, for example, right? I, you know, so re really the, the level of spending is correct. And I'll, I'll just give you an example, right? It's an organization that works in the Department of Defense supply chain and creates and stores maybe classified information, maybe it's controlled unclassified information um, or data, you know, is going to invest more in cybersecurity than and uh, you know maybe a non-regulated organization looking to renew an insurance policy and just needs to check a few boxes right need to deploy multi-factor authentication maybe deploy uh, endpoint detection and response uh, have a documented incident response plan so <clears throat> really it's helpful to understand what, what are you trying to protect and what is the value of that you know and then looking at how much down downtime can I uh, you know uh, take, right, if, if ransomware, you know, uh, chops me off at the knees. Um, and then I, I'd say lastly, this is a really important one, and you've probably heard this from us before, but pick and align to a framework. I mean, it's easy if you're in a regulated industry, you know, you know that health healthcare, you're going to have to align to something like HIPAA. Um, you know, in, in, in manufacturing, we see ISO 20, 27,000. Um, uh, if you're uh, defense industry base, it's CMMC. We'll talk about this a little bit later. But if you're in an unregulated market, then there's frameworks that you can pick that are more practical and pragmatic that will help drive the overall security program um, moving forward. And then, you know, once all this happens, it, it's time to get to work, right? We talk about um, assess to understand posture and weaknesses. The assessment on the output side is going to create remediation tasks and a roadmap. Um, certainly, there needs to be a focus on end user security awareness training um, and testing because that's a weak link in the attack vector. Um, tuning and creating the security program <clears throat> once the ground is softened, right, through, through the training process. Um, and then you, you move into more advanced capabilities, detection, response, containment, uh, remediation, which we'll talk about. Um, and and it's, it's improving every step of the way. And then it's 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 rinse and repeat, right? You gotta uh, you know keep keep uh, going back to this this journey and, and do it all over again, maybe with a little bit different approach um, after you you get out of the gate. And then um, <clears throat> this is uh, this is a, a James Melcher special. James is our our CTO, and, and uh, it's great having you know cybersecurity discussions with him, but. This is the evolution of security. Most organizations are at a, what we call level three, which is um, defense in, in, in depth, right? Or, 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 or 
uh, defense and layers. And so if you look at these first three phases, um, they're, they're very heavily aligned to tools and instrumentation. And so where organizations have a challenge evolving is into phase four, phase five, so security operations center, uh, detection and response, containment and remediation, what, you know, whether that's uh, internally, you know, it's sort of a build uh, versus a buy through, through a, a service provider um, like us. And, and the, the, the tough pivot to phase four and five is, it's not just about tools, it's about having people in place that are going to be there to interpret data, uh, take action if there's incident, be eyes on glass 24 by 7 because the hackers don't, don't uh, sleep, and then also the appropriate uh, framework to dictate workflow once an anomaly is, is discovered. So um, we thought we'd uh, you know, share our, our evolution of security, but you know, ultimately organizations are going to need to be in this level four, level five, uh, whether it's through compliance and regulation or just to keep things uh, you know, safe and secure as, as hackers get more sophisticated. Um, Johnny, any, any comments? You know, it's really both. I mean, it's, it is checking the boxes, right? But it, it is truly making these companies more secure. And I think, uh, I think Diopath is really good about demonstrating that for our clients and, uh, you know, in the form of document, ongoing documentation and reporting and uh, evidence and, and whatnot. So that's all, Matt. Yeah. Okay. And then, you know, th there are a handful of recurring reasons that, that Diopath is, is being brought in to help and, and other third parties as, as well. Um, it, you know, and, and so I'll just, I'll hit on a few of these. So if you, if you look at one, and three, cybersecurity insurance and clients and partners, you know, that, that, that's really what we consider compliance by proxy, right? So there's a, another entity that all of a sudden is, is uh, you know, looking under the hood of your security program. And if they're not satisfied, um, you know, there, 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 there could be some pain, right? You might miss out on uh, being awarded a bid um, you may lose a partner because they're worried about uh, a supply chain attack. Um, you might not be able to contain your costs on, on cybersecurity insurance uh, renewals or policies. We're hearing a lot of that. <clears throat> so so we, we see a fair amount of that. Certainly <clears throat> compliance and regulation. So um, prepping for an audit, um, you know, prepping to, to go through a certification process. Um, so, so there's a lot that we see there. Um, recent breaches, uh, we'll, we'll cite a few examples in a little bit, um, but if somebody gets breached, you know, that's an eye opener, right? And all of a sudden there's this top down approach to how are we doing with security? Um, you know, the boardroom and executive leadership team, you know, this slowdown where maybe they're in a peer group and they hear a horror story, you know, and they, and they go to the, the IT uh, sec ops team and say, are, are, are we safe for the IT operations team? And then, you know, lastly, um, back to that comment about fixation on tools and instrumentation and the cart before the horse, if there's been heavy investments made in tools, uh, you know, there's almost this retrospective, okay, now we need to maximize the value of these tools um, and we need help with the people in process. And, and so, you know, we're, we're seeing engagements to, to third parties as a result of that. Um, you know, as, as far as, uh, the anatomy of an assessment, because <clears throat> we're, we're asked to define what's an assessment from Diopass perspective. And a lot of folks use pen testing synonymously as, as a security assessment, and, and that is uh, a component. Um, so again, back to the whole you know, des desired outcome, are you looking to pass an audit, check a box, win a contract, retain a client? Um, and then you know, what, what happens uh, you know, after that is um, you know, we, we go into, you know, more of the tactical pieces. So vulnerability scanning, right? That's automated, non-intrusive. We're, we're, we're leveraging software on the outside and inside of the network to see if there's any glaring gaps. And uh, Sean Trojak, our, uh, our IT security practice lead, his analogy is home security. If you're walking down a driveway, 
uh, to, to, or walking up a driveway to someone's house, do the lights, the motion sensors go off, right? That, that's automated, that's vulnerability scanning. Um, if you look at pen, penetration testing, that's intrusive. That's our security analysts that are trying to ethically hack you again outside the network and inside the network. And the analogy back to home security would be uh, somebody going up and jiggling a, a doorknob. Is it locked, right? Going to the windows, trying to lift it up, seeing what weaknesses there are from a, I'd see more of a manual perspective. Um, then, you know, you get into architecture and configuration review. So network, cloud, OS, identity management, the end users, uh, data applications, there's all these things that make the uh, organizations that you're at hum from a technology perspective. How are they stitched together? And if we have some interviewing and whiteboarding sessions, then we can get a pretty good handle on uh, are, are there obvious things that, that might need to be fixed? An example is, are your backups air gapped from the network in the event you have ransomware? That's just one example. Um, and then, you know, a controls assessment. So. Um, I'll, I'll show you an example of, of CIS and what the controls are there if you don't know, but you know, there, there, there's NIST, there's HIPAA, there's PCI, there's CMMC, there, there's a whole host of, uh, of, of, of tools, uh, or sorry, con, uh, you know, control frameworks that are out there. Um, and, and CIS 20 is a good one if um, you guys don't know where to start. And I'm just going to quickly show you what that looks like if I can. Hopefully I can here. Johnny, while I'm I'm looking, uh, anything else to add? I can tell a joke or two. Um, no, don't don't okay. do that. Um, right. I, I found it. I saved everyone. So um uh you know th th this is CIS top 20, right? So there's basic foundational um, and, and organizational controls. So it's things like having continuous vulnerability management, it's data recovery capabilities, it's wireless access controls, it's having the appropriate boundary defenses, um, it's performing you know, routine penetration tests and, and red team exercises. So this is really your, your run book, your playbook from a control standpoint. And if, if you look at something like NIST, uh, 800 171 as a controls framework, there's 130 that are on there, give or take. So if, if that is uh, going to blow your mind as far as how do we execute against that, CIS 20, for, for those that are uninitiated, is a, a great uh, jumping off point. So I wanted to share that with you. All right. Um, we have a we have a question. Oh yeah. Yeah. So uh, we actually have a um a great one here. So the question is: Does Diopath require its staff to have ITIL certifications, or is it just for metric management? Um, that's a uh, that's a great question, and yes, to 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 both. So I think it's. Um, a guiding light uh, for us. So ITIL is uh, Information Technology Infrastructure Library, and it's a it, it's a framework that allows our organization to align technology uh, to serve the business, meet the goals of, of the business, and also in this case address risk management. Um, so so I think we use it as a guiding framework. Uh, overarching and then we also have individuals on staff that have gone through the certification process so that we can deliver according to ITIL but I, uh, I love that question thanks um, and then just you know, what last thing uh, sorry uh, Bethany any other questions no Matt that's all for now thank you yeah, and then, um, you know, the, the last piece of the report, which is, you know, essentially a roadmap. Here's a, here's where the current posture is, here's the weaknesses, so that they can be acted upon, hopefully reasonably quickly, depending on severity. And then we get into what does that one, two, three year, you know, uh, road, roadmap look like? So that that's really an, an anatomy of an assessment, the critical components, 
There's certainly other things that we can sprinkle in, um, awareness training, compromise assessment, um, you know, source code review if organizations have created uh, homegrown apps. But uh, th these these six out or sorry five elements are uh, generally included in most of our assessments. Matt, I'll just uh, add one thing to the the report. So. Um, we're very good about customizing the report uh, to meet whatever the original goals were. So, you know, if it is, you know, hey, we need to become, you know, compliant in this framework or uh, we're, you know, prepping for this certification or we were uh, breached, we're worried about ransomware. So we will tailor the report um, to meet the IT director or CIO's goals ultimately. So. Just an FYI, there it, it's not a standard process. Yeah, it, that, that's that's a great point. And and you know, on our report, I mean, obviously there's some trepidation heading into a security assessment on, you know, what uh, what skeletons are we going to find in the closet? And so generally, you know, during report review, um, we'll, we'll do uh, you know, WebEx go to meeting, review the first draft real time, and make edits to that draft before anything is submitted securely to our clients just because um you know there, there, there's there's some sensitivity around that right and and uh you know johnny to your point sometimes it's you know more targeted targeted to the executive level of the board you know, maybe it's a report that is focused on a supplier or a client you know some type of third party and an auditor um so i think that's a really good point <clears throat> Um, okay, so uh, assessment of case study. California-based engineering construction company, uh, mid-market, 2,000 employees, 30 sites. Um, they were breached not once but twice. Uh, one of those was was pretty severe. Um, you know, obviously, you know, management said we, we can't allow this to happen again. Um, so we need a, a comprehensive assessment. And um, ironically, uh, in the process, of starting the assessment, we found another dwelling threat um, with some of the tools that we were leveraging. So we had to pivot to, to incident response. Um, but but basically, after the assessment was done, um, you know there was the, the shift even in, um, in in the IT department from this reactive nature to addressing security to getting more strategic. And so what happened? I, I thought this was pretty interesting. Being a larger company. They made investments in security operations, so advanced tools, uh, trained up some people, cross-trained some people, um, you know, implemented uh, your know, process, and and it's amazing what happened almost over a year. You know how they became so much more mature in 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 handling things and and, and even thwarting campaigns, and then you know they they they, uh, they held their um, their hand up. And said, uh, you know, there there are services that are going to be too expensive to build. Um, so let's go ahead and outsource those. So things like managed security operations center, and then even you know migrating to uh, you know what's called red teaming, which is more continuous uh, you know, pen testing, vulnerability scanning. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, they went from hairs on fire, you know, chaotic state to um, you know, they're, they're probably at least phase four, um, you know, getting close to um, phase five. And that, that happened in a 12 month period. So uh, I thought that might be an interesting one to, to, to talk through. Um, so outside of cyber uh, insurance, the second most popular topic we talk about in the field is, is end user security awareness training. Um, why, I think you guys all know, uh, users are the weakest link, like we said earlier, and it's a, a really good social engineering campaign, sometimes a not so good social engineering campaign will often trump um, technology. And so we want to elevate the security consciousness uh, and promote a security-minded culture, and hopefully we can do that starting with executive leadership and then that that sort of filters down. Um, the approach can be automated, 
with learning management platforms like Know Before, like Wombat, um, it, it, and can it can be um, live and customized. Um, it can be a combination of those things. We like a balance. We like live and customized because there's interaction and it allows uh, us to connect with the audience better and that message to resonate. Um, and that normally happens from our security analyst telling, um, you know, really war stories, right? They're out, out there in the trenches um, and they're seeing what's happening. Um, and then there, there's two things that we've talked about with uh, a number of CIOs recently, um, training fatigue. Um, so it, it gets to the point where, gosh, I've got to do this training again this quarter and it's 30 minutes and um, I'm just going to blow through it. And, and, and that type of training, when you get that attitude, uh, becomes, uh, I mean, it's the opposite of what you're looking for, right? So if that happens, if you're doing things too frequently, don't be afraid to change the cadence, change the approach um, so that it is more, more effective. And then the other interesting conversation we have is what to do with non-compliant end users, right? If it, if, you know, there's been you know, three tests or quizzes that have been administered and folks aren't responding to them. And we've, uh, you know, seen public shaming. We've seen network access cut off. We've seen nothing happen, right? And, and, and I'm not here to give you an answer because I think it's never one size fits all, but think about what happens if you have folks that aren't compliant, especially with, with testing. Because uh, you know, I think that that's something that needs to be game plan for and addressed. And then test, right? Uh, do some social engineering campaigns, whether it's automated or manual, and then you know, hold, hold, hold people accountable and talk to them, coach them up if, if there's mistakes that have, have been made. Um, Johnny, anything here? Um, no, you know, I, I'll say that Every training session that I've uh, listened in on, uh, I'm, I find myself uh, surprised, if not shocked, by the amount of people who really still don't understand uh, the concept of phishing um, and uh, how many end users actually take the bait and click on the attachment. And some even still will give their credentials and, and whatnot. So it's something that needs to happen periodically and it, it, it's a key component to any security program. Yeah. Yeah, a, a, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the phishing attacks are getting so much more sophisticated. There's, there's so much work being done up front. Higher value targets are being, um, you know, picked on. It's more individualized. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty scary. That, uh, makes a lot of people nervous, right? And what, what end users are doing and, and how equipped they are to handle ruses. Um, so security program, um, you know, we, we've, uh, you know, generally assessments and security awareness training highlight, uh, the need for work on an organization security program. And, you know, we've said it already, it's not just about deploying tools. Um, we've found that most organizations are in a position to hire a chief information security officer. Um, however, that function is critical to the overall success of the security and risk management program. Um, you know, that said, you know, flexing in to a third party, an individual, that can provide those advisory services, and that's certainly something that we do, um, is, is a good option. And, you know, our resources in particular, uh, I, I think, are in a great position to help because I've seen them operate at a strategic level. So you, you build out the, the plan and then um, help with more of the heavy lifting on the tactical, tactical and technical side, so connecting the dots. So what we've seen in the industry is there's a lot of really good advisory folks that can put together the plan, but then not necessarily execute, and then things get lost in translation, or you have the inverse where you've got really good technical people, 
but zooming out and looking big picture, uh, you know, becomes uh, becomes a challenge. Um, and then <laughs> somebody asked us this last week, uh, you know, because I think it was in response, Johnny, to a, uh, in, in, an insurance uh, questionnaire. Well, what virtual CISO? Like, what, what does it? What does that mean? What you know? What's included in that? I know it's a role, but you know, help me understand. Um, you know, kind of the, the tasks involved with an advisory engagement. And, you know, I know there's a level of frustration in the conversation because it's a little bit nebulous, but, you know, uh, CISO, it, you know, it takes care of vision alignment, right? You know, so, so you look at things like interviews, knowledge transfer, documentation review, architecture, controls assessment, um, adjustments to the environment, mock audits, you know, further training, you know, all these things need to be, uh, you know, part of the, the program. Um, and, and then you, there, there's tactical stuff that needs to happen. So vision alignment, um, integrating an assessment, right, into an advisory uh, program, audit readiness and prep. I mean, these are things that, that our folks are seeing. Questionnaire assistance, um, you know, roadmap development, you know, policies and procedural development. And then the, the ongoing piece, and so the best thing is probably give you an example, right? So global UCAS provider, unified communications is a service provider. Um, and Johnny, I'd love for you to chime in here. You're close to this one. Um, you know, incident, uh, records were inadvertently exposed, stolen, posted. Um, the risk certainly was reputational damage and potential loss of revenue, which I think they, they mitigated for the most part. Short-term action, absolutely. Tell the insurance company there's been an event. Uh, forensics firm was hired, brought in. Uh, they did kind of the cleanup. But then there was this longer term, we need to assess and advance the overall security uh, posture. And when you peel the onion back, um, they wanted to go and get aligned to SOC 2, Type 2 um, as a framework. And they also needed to uh, comply with PCI DSS, I can't remember what category, right? But because um, they were uh, doing credit card transactions, storing that type of data. Um, so the challenge was they had no expertise or resources on staff to even figure out where, where to start, right? Um, and so here's what it kind of looked like. It was supposed to be a four month engagement. Um, and this is the first phase, you know, certainly rolled into, I think, at least six months, possibly longer. <clears throat> but let's align the vision and strategy. Let's develop and update policies. Let's look at controls, what, what exists. Let's look at the existing configuration baselines. <clears throat> you know, what are the vulnerabilities? And, and, and let's create a remediation plan. How is encryption being used, right? So that was month one. And then it was, let's mature the capabilities uh, uh, you know, overall in the remediation. Let's start to look at more of the control stuff from a, uh, a PCI and a SOC 2. So, uh, you know, if the, if the controls weren't in place, let's put them in place. And then, you know, we rolled into, um, you know, doing a mock audit, you know, before an actual audit was going to happen. And then we had a little bit of tuning to do. Uh, we looked at the incident response plan. And then we engaged once the SOC 2 auditor came in and started doing the work, we were there side by side with the client, stepping them through the, the process. And then, you know, there's an ongoing component that will, will happen. But that, that's, you know, again, people say virtual CISO and they have a hard time getting their head wrapped around what does that look like. That is an example of uh, an engagement. So, Johnny, any, anything to add here? Because, like I said, I know you're uh, pretty close to this one. Uh, you know, I can, <laughs> there's so much to it, but I think we're really good at staying on track, defining the milestones, defining, defining roles and responsibilities. Um, and, uh, you know, cause I think that's always a concern when you have such a, uh, you know, on the surface and unwieldy looking process, but, uh, it's it's doable and we do it for a lot of customers and it, it's certainly a valuable service uh, that I think the market in general is recognizing now that hey we ain't got the money to to hire somebody and and tackle all these things and so uh, 
I, I think we're a good fit for the for those types of engagements. Yeah, thanks. And then we're 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 winding things down. So uh, you thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, so uh, manage uh, extended detection and response. So so let's talk about SOC as a service. So there is most certainly a need in the market and in some cases a requirement for organizations to have a bundle of advanced tools to thwart would-be attackers uh, and then the monitoring and management of those tools using people and then back to that whole workflow um, you know, topic. So, so what's the process that dictates workflow? And so really that's exactly what SOC as a service or managed uh, detection and response is. And so I've got a diagram here for you uh, and, and we'll just walk through the, the, the different components. So uh, starting off, right, you've got on the left-hand side, um, your network. Um, you know, and, and, and if we look at the perimeter, um, traffic's coming in and out all day long, uh, you know, at, at, at network egress points. And so we want to analyze that traffic for something that might be suspicious. So we run a network traffic analyzer out of band at your network egress points um, so that we're able to assess um, that traffic. And then, you know, there's, there's managed uh, SIM, security information event management. So all of the stuff on the network creates security logs, right? We want to ingest those security logs. We want to filter out the noise using some analytics. And, you know, typically we're left with things that uh, might be more actionable or they're worth investigating. Um, so basically that's what, what uh, SIM is. And then you have, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this, it not only next gen antivirus, but endpoint detection and response that can be loaded up on, uh, you know, servers and, and, and workstations. So that's um, really, you know, next gen antivirus on, on, on steroids. So it's not just looking for patterns, it's looking for anomalies. Um, you're able to, to use this platform um, for for threat hunting, you're able to you know kind of you know dig in if there has been an incident and and follow the breadcrumbs to you know where maybe uh, an attack started with uh, endpoint detection or response, um, and then you have you know uh, vulnerability scanning that needs to occur right. So checking for those gaps, those weaknesses uh, automatically on a recurring basis, whether that's weekly, uh, every other week, monthly. Um, and then you've got a whole host of integ uh, you know integrations you need to consider. If you're in um, you know Microsoft 365, Azure, AWS, Google, or there are other applications in your security stack that we need to ingest data from, the idea is to get this 360 degree view of your environment, uh, and then we store all that data on a dedicated instance, the cloud collector. It's encrypted from end to end and when it sits there it's stored there for a year um, and then you have the people behind it interpreting and taking action uh, and then we have we have the NIST cybersecurity framework that, that dictates uh, workflow. So in a nutshell that's um, SOC as a service or managed extended detection response you'll hear it called a, a whole host of things and that's what um, <clears throat> makes up our, uh, our offering. And so we're, we're getting a lot of uh, in inquiries about this because um, insurance providers, say you need to have something in place like this, right? Or um, a supplier, a large client might suggest need something like this in place. Um, so Johnny, anything uh, to add here? Uh, just that uh, interest is peaking in managed security across the board. Um, so keep your, keep your ears open. Yeah, it it, it, uh, it it most certainly is. Um, okay, and then uh, I think we've got one or two more slides, and then I think we'll have a little bit of time for for any questions that are out there. So I mentioned uh, red teaming. Um, you know, we're also calling it security assessment 2.0. Um, we feel that going through a security assessment 
once a year or even that duration is longer has become an outdated uh, practice, right? Because of how quickly threats are, are evolving. So to take a snapshot of the environment and then remediate against that over time, it's hard to stay in lockstep with the, the threat actors and what they're doing. So with, with, with red teaming, and this is something that came from you know, the federal space, um, it is security assessment that's ongoing as a service. So typically it includes ongoing penetration testing and vulnerability scanning. It occurs with greater frequency, weekly, monthly, um, you know, every month. Uh, it can align to a de desired schedule and incorporate some automation. Um, and, and we got some interesting feedback from a client the other day who does red teaming and did a security assessment with us, said, hey, when it was a one-time security assessment, everyone kind of knew about it, right? So they were on their best behavior. Um, if you do red teaming, uh, I think you can catch uh, people or, or maybe tools <laughs> or process off guard if you do it on a NOS, um, uh, you know, over, uh, over time, right? Um, so I thought that was interesting feedback. Um, we talked about the fact that this is more of a snapshot. It's um, more than a snapshot. It's giving you a um, near real time, where are you guys at, right, with, with your security posture so that you can drive continuous improvement faster. Um, and then, you know, it, it validates tools, people, and process, um, you know, which we would consider, you know, blue team. So if, if, if red team is the offense, you know, we're going on the offense, we're trying to explode some vulnerabilities and weaknesses. The blue team is the, uh, you know, internal folks and tools and process that are going to catch, um, you know, a pen test, right, and what, what's happening there. Um, and then, uh, you know, tickets, right, can be opened up with a service desk, for example, to alter scope. So there might be a scenario where, gee, I'm really, uh, I'm worried about my, my cloud environment at the moment. So let's do, you know, maybe a quick pivot to that and spend time and effort on cloud versus, you know, a more, more general approach. So uh, a lot more on this front and, you know, please, you know, let us know if you have any questions, but I think this is kind of the future of how to assess the environment. Um, it's it's going to be more, more effective. So high value, you know, low, low cost. Johnny? Nope. It's an ad. Um, okay, stop sharing. Um, so, uh, Bethany, any, um, any additional questions? Um, so the question is, how do you promote a proactive state of security for small companies who are unable to have a large IT team? Yeah. Um, well, so, so, so data security for a, a smaller company, I, I think it, it goes back to, we should sit, sit down and have a, a chat on what that data is. Um, you know, is it, is it PII? Is it uh, personal health information, right? So what is, is the value of that? And what's the, the, the desired outcome so we can dictate an approach? But the, the bottom line is, um, if, it, if it's going to be difficult to make those investments and then build a team around it and process, which it typically is, then we have a whole range of managed security solutions, <clears throat> even point solutions where we can, you know, secure an env environment, right? So we can uh, make that data immutable. We have a, a data security as a service offering, right? That I hate to talk about specific tools but uh, they're out there. We just wanna make sure they're aligned to a broader um, security strategy, but um, happy to talk through that uh, offline if you need some help there, but uh, we, we've got uh, solutions and services for that if yeah. you need to outsource. Yeah, and Matt, if I could also mention, you know, um, I think one thing that Matt and I always try to hammer home is, look, you know, Diopath, we have a, a TCP, right? A, a typical, um, customer profile and you know sure we, we 
cater to larger customers um, on the IT side, right? On the, the managed services, the service desk and NOC, um, cloud and, and things like that. But when it comes to security, we do have some smaller customers, right? I mean, we have a customer, we have a couple of customers that are, are sub 30 employees um, that we've customized, as Matt mentioned, our, our managed security offerings for them to make it more affordable and make sure that they're feeling secure and doing the things that they need to do um, to satisfy vendors or, or whoever. So yeah, uh, it's case by case, I would say. Yeah, yeah, good, good question. Um, Bethany, anything else out there from the attendees? I don't see any, uh, I don't see any other questions right now, Matt. Okay, well, um, that's the content we had for today. Um, so we really, really appreciate everybody spending time. Um, you know, happy to talk in more detail about, uh, you know, some of the content. If you'd like, uh, you, you know where to find us, or you can engage your account manager. But uh, thank you again, Bethany, back over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, John, uh, for your time today and this really great content. And uh, thanks to all of our attendees today for, for joining us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we did record this webinar and we'll have it sent out to you tomorrow, um, but you can also find this along with all of our other uh, webinar content on our YouTube channel. Um, we have events pretty regularly, so check out our website, dialpath.com, and you can find everything that's upcoming um, and the topics related to those, um, and feel free to register as well. So thanks, everyone, and hope, hope you all have a great day. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.